Hello? All right, well, I guess we'll use this one. See, I'm not very fond of having this thing hanging over my ear. I feel like I have a, a e an ear longer than the other one, carrying the little microphone around, and then it goes, it goes all over the place. You don't notice because I am very discreet about it, but it goes all over the place, that little microphone. So anyway, so we'll give a, a, very, a very nice, wonderful, amazing, thoughtful, prayerful explanation of the Mass. And I hope it helps you. I know that it's being recorded and it's being live streamed um, to people that are not able to be present here. So I hope this also helps to those who are not present to grow into the appreciation of the Mass and the understanding a little bit more of what the Mass is all about. And as you know, and I shared this also with the other group that I gave the explanation of the Mass, when we come to ask ourselves, what is the Mass? What is it? Right? You come every Sunday. You're asked to come every Sunday. And if you noticed, in uh, the, the Five Commandments of uh, the Church, we're asked to come to church every single Sunday. Obviously, in a negative sense, but it's always, the negative is always positive, under the pain of mortal sin. Not because the church wants to punish you, to punish us if we don't come to church, but to make, us real, to make us realize by the commandment how important it is to come to church on Sundays, on the day of the Lord, to witness, to participate and experience and live precisely just as the Blessed Mother on, on, in Calvary ourselves at the altar, right? the redemption of each one of us and of the whole of mankind, right? The center of history, the center of our life, that which gives meaning to every single second and every single moment of our day. If we don't get this, then the commandment of the church becomes tortuous, right? Became, becomes a very very heavy to carry, right? Especially when you are having a party on Sundays, right? When you uh, watch the Super Bowl and the night before, you, were go went, you went to bed really late and you wake up at 12 at noon, right? So, four things, as our church tells us, that the Mass is all about. It's the form of a prayer that St. Thomas Aquinas said many, 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 many years ago, about 800 years, but still valid, all right? goes like this, Mass is, and the form that he said it, uh, addressing it to the Lord, O sacred banquet in which God is our food, grace is given to us, we celebrate the memorial of his passion and death, and we receive the pledge of the glory to come. Easy, right? O sacred banquet, the Mass is a banquet in which we receive Jesus Christ as our food, nourishment for the body and the soul, right? So grace is given to us, right? We celebrate, we commemorate, we bring to the present or to the here and now, that's why we call it the memorial, the memorial of the suffering and death of our Lord, okay? And we receive the pledge of the glory to come. We receive a promise that if we come to church, we participate in church, we participate in Mass, you are given the promise that you will be in heaven. Obviously, by participating in Mass doesn't mean that you are sitting in the pew. It means participating. It means actively taking part of the Mass. Right? If I or you are being asked to sing in church, if you don't sing, is that participation? If I go and you line up for communion and I say, body of Christ, and you say, is that participating? If because you don't want to or, I don't know, it's difficult for you not to go to confession and therefore you don't receive communion, is that participating fully? No, right? So it's a way to say you will be in heaven as much as you participate here in the sacrament as long as you actively take part of the Mass, right? O sacred banquet in which Christ is our food, we celebrate the memorial of his passion and death. Grace is given to us and we receive the pledge of the glory to come. Easy? 
banquet or sacred banquet in which Christ is our food. We celebrate the memorial of his passion and death. Grace is given to us and we receive the pledge of the glory to come. You should learn it by, by heart, okay? This is a mess. This is a mess. Okay, so as you know, the mess is, is divided into two different parts, two main parts. The liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, right? Why the word liturgy? Liturgy means the work given by us, men and women, that is due to God, our Lord, right? That's what liturgy means, right? So the Mass is divided into two main parts, the liturgy of the Word, by which we are nourished in our mind and in our heart, and then by the liturgy of the Eucharist, by which we are nourished in our soul, right, in our body, okay? The liturgy of the Word is like the preparation to welcome in our hearts and in our minds what we receive bodily, right, in our flesh and in our soul, Jesus Christ our Lord, okay? So, liturgy of the Word. The liturgy of the Word is divided also by several parts. The penitential rite, or actually even before that, the procession, the procession, right? The sign of the cross, the penitential rite, salutation, penitential rite, the opening prayer. I'll go little by little uh, back again into each one of them. The opening prayer, right? Or the collect prayer. Collect means to bring everybody together. Collect, not to collect, like asking for money, right? Collect, tying everybody together. Then, first reading, if it's Sunday, Psalms, second reading, acclamation before the gospel, the gospel, the homily, homily, not sermon, okay? Sermon is generic, right? Homily, right? Then after the homily, we have the proclamation of our faith by the creed. Then we have the prayers of the faithful. And with the prayers of the faithful, we conclude. We, con we start asking the Lord to forgive our sins, and then we conclude asking the Lord for the living and the dead. First, we pray for us, and then we pray for everybody else at the end. We start with us, we con and we go to God, and then we Conclude again with us. Okay. So, procession. The procession, the meaning of the procession is that we are advancing, we are moving towards the altar, obviously, but that has a, has a, has a symbolic meaning that we are approaching in time, little by little, to this mountain. As you know, the altar is supposed to be on this area, which is called sanctuary. Okay? Sanctuary. In Spanish, it's called presbiterio, presbytery, all right? The presbytery, presbyterio, all right? Sanctuary, all right? The area of the holy of holies. Sanctus means holy, right? The area of the holy of holies. And normally has three steps. We don't count this one, or we could one, two, three, and we're up there, right? There's normally three, five, seven steps, right? Obviously, symbolic meaning. At Holy Trinity, you're supposed to have three steps, obviously, right? You cannot do with five or seven. So we are going up the mountain. Why the mountain? Obvious, it's obvious, the meaning of the mountain, right? So we process, we are moving towards heaven, or we are going towards Zion. Zion is on a, on a hill. We're going high. We're in the height. We encounter God, right? As we arrive here, because we have the Blessed Sacrament, Okay? The first thing that we do, we honor the Blessed Sacrament. We do what is called genuflection. Genuflection. Genu in Latin means knee. Flexion means to bend. In the bending of the knee, the right knee goes down all the way to the ground. Okay? All the way down there. Wow. <laughs> okay? And then ugh, up. For those who are able, okay? There are only two times in which when the Blessed Sacrament is present, we genuflect at the beginning and at the end. And then we act as if the center of our attention is no longer the Blessed Sacrament of the back, is the altar. The altar becomes, becomes the center. And that's why 
when we move around and about, we bow before the altar, which also has a meaning of God's presence, and it has a meaning of the place of the sacrifice, right? The most important thing of the four things that I mentioned about what the Eucharist is, the most important one is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Not celebration. Somehow, in the common, the popular feeling is that we come and celebrate. Yes, we do celebrate, but we celebrate because we are happy that Christ, that Christ offered himself up for us. And that he's inviting us to also offer ourselves. So, genuflection. After the genuflection, we come up, right? And we venerate. This is called what? Altar. The altar. Not table. Not table. There's no table here, right? I think right now it's more obvious than before that this is altar. Okay? Altar. So we venerate by kissing it. We kiss the altar. Okay? The priest stands here at the center because this is where the sacrifice is going to be offered. And right below, as you remember, those who were present at the, the consecration of the altar, there is a relic, the relic here in our church of St. Maria Goretti. Okay? Uh, a saint was offered in sacrifice, and therefore we commemorate and we honor the altar by having a relic. So we venerate, and then we go to this part of the sanctuary. This is called the sedes. Sedes means chair. Sedes, right? If it were the cathedral, this would, this would be called the cathedra. Cathedra means chair. Cathedral means the place where there is a chair. The chair where the pastor imparts his teaching. Okay? This is not cathedral. This is not the cathedra. This is just sedes. Sedes, right? The Blessed Mother is also called sedes sapiensiae. The chair of wisdom, right? Seat of wisdom, right? So, we start with the sign of the cross. Everything starts with the sign of the cross, right? With the advocation of the Blessed Trinity. And we will finish the Mass also with the advocation of the Blessed Trinity and the sign of the cross. The, the sign of the Christians, okay? The salutation. Salutation goes like this. Shares the Spirit and wishes the Spirit to go to you. You don't answer by giving the Spirit back. Right? And also with you. No. You don't give it back to me. Keep it. It's yours. It's yours to be given to you. All right? Hold it. All right? This is not a liturgical sign for the assembly. Okay? It's not a liturgical sign for the assembly. It's only for the priest. Why there is a difference between the priest and the assembly? Because all the sacrifices, all the prayers that are being offered are being, so to speak, centered like a laser into the ministry of the priest who at this moment, in the moment of the celebration of any sacrament, he's no longer there. His personality, so to speak, disappears. That's why he's dressed up in a different way than every, anyone else, right? Is he's acting in the person of Jesus Christ. So we are uniting ourselves to him. You know how we say at the end of the Eucharistic prayer? Through him, within, and in him. Okay? So through the ministry of the priest, which is the priesthood of Jesus Christ, which he, which he shares, everything is elevated to Christ, or to God, sorry, to God the Father, in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So that's why if you do this, you're acting as another priest. So how many priesthoods do we have? One, right? Okay? That's why it's important to do the signs that are proper, right? If I weren't the main priest, in the case that I'm not the main celebrant, I don't go, I'm with your spirit. You notice that? All right, next time there is a celebration, check. Check as well, okay? So the salutation, and it's a Trinitarian salutation. The praise of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The three persons of the Blessed Trinity and with your spirit is the answer, right? Invitation to the act of penance, right? We make a little examination of conscience. We are getting ready to, be, to purify our hearts. Our sins, venial sins and imperfections are forgiven at that moment. And also, especially when the priest says the absolution at that moment. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life, right? With invocation 
of a very ancient, very ancient petition, which in most often cases it remains not in Latin but in Greek, Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison is not Latin, okay? It's not Latin, it's Greek. Somebody said to me, oh, I just love Latin, especially Kyrie eleison. Well, sorry, it's Greek, all right? Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, right? And then if it's Sunday and if it's not during Lent, the Gloria, except today, right? Or March the 25th, which is another solemnity, right? What's March the 25th? Annunciation, right? The Annunciation of the Lord. Are the two major feast days that land on Lent. Not St. Patrick's. It's almost there, but it's not a solemnity here in the United States. Maybe in Ireland it is, right? The Gloria, in which we glorify God, and we start to speak open our hearts and minds to receive the Word of God. Then comes the collect prayer. As I mentioned, the prayer is what gives the meaning and the tone of what the readings and the sense of the rest of the Mass is all about. Right? And then it concludes with, <clears throat> with a long phrase. These long phrases that are very constant, right? They are called formula, right? Like the formula of baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's called formula. The formula of the conclusion of the collect prayer, right? It's also a confession of faith, right? It's a mini, mini creed that was even prior to the nicene constantinopolitan Creed that we say after the homily. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. That phrase was a creed, a very ancient creed from the times of the Arians, right? That was, what, fourth century, early fourth century. That was a way to tell whether you believe in Jesus Christ as divine, contrary to the Arians, who thought that Jesus Christ was a servant, was an angel, was someone not divine below God. That's why it says, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. It proclaims the quality of Jesus Christ with God. Even though the whole Mass we directed, if you notice, the whole Mass is prayed to God the Father, but through Jesus Christ, right? Then we sit down. Why do we sit down? The symbolism of sitting down is to listen, all right? To raise our ears because faith comes through hearing because we can't see. That's the symbolism of sitting down at that moment, okay? Then as we sit down, right? The Word of God, is it read or what is it? Proclaimed. Very good. It's proclaimed. The Word of God is proclaimed. What is the name of this thing? Ambo, right? Ambo. Not lectern. Lectern is the one over there. This one is Ambo. And this one is used only to proclaim the Word of God, right? You sit down to listen, right? To listen in faith. Okay, there's a phrase in our, in our catechism that says, faith comes by hearing because we can't see. Faith comes by hearing. So we increase our faith by hearing. All right? That's why when somebody proclaims the word of God, okay, you don't read like this. You don't read like this. A reading from the gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. Why is that? Why you can't read like that? Like if you were doing a normal reading. Because you don't want the attention to you. The attention is to the Word. Because the Bible, sacred scripture as we call it in us Catholics, it's not Bible. Sacred scripture, even if it's a longer phrase, right? And there is, there is more saliva to use. Sacred scripture, no Bible. Sacred scripture. Sacred scripture is such, was written precisely to be proclaimed, not to be stored in a book. When it's in a book, it's dead. When it comes alive, 
is when it's proclaimed. And therefore, when the lector finishes, obviously, on his Sundays, they had to close the lectionary. Lectionary is the book of the readings. Lectionary, right? They close it for practical uh, purposes because the deacon is going to come and bring the, this, called, this is called Evangelarium, the book of the Gospels, Evangelarium, okay? He's going to use Evangelarium, right? And he's going to proclaim the Gospel. And because the Word of God is alive, you keep the book open, not closed, not kept and tucked away like it used to be. It should, be, should remain open, Okay? Because the word of God is alive. As a matter of fact, in Hebrew, years past, right, centuries past, you couldn't understand the reading unless you would hear it because it needed accents. And they wouldn't put the accents and tones in the writing unless you heard it. All right? And that's why the word of God, that's the symbolism too, that the word of God has to be proclaimed. And the perfection of the Word of God is when it's proclaimed in the liturgy. Okay? Not when you read it at home. Here, in the context of the assembly. Okay? When the gospel is proclaimed, obviously, we stand up. The deacon asks for the blessing, or the priest would come to the center, to the altar, in front of the altar, and will do a personal prayer. All right? Enlighten. I don't know. To be, to be honest, I don't even know how it goes in English. Um, purify my heart and my mind so that I can proclaim worthily the Word of God. Something like that. Okay? He comes, or the deacon says, Lord, give, uh, Father, give me your blessing. May the Lord... Uh, what does it go? May the Lord be in your heart and in your mind so that you can proclaim worthily the Word of God. There you go. That's how it goes. Right? And then... The Lord be with you. And he doesn't go here. The priest, nobody says the Lord be with you. It's the Lord be with you. Right? No signs. Why? Because we are going to proclaim the word of God. And the center is the word. Right? With your spirit. Not with your spirit again. Right? A reading from the Holy Gospel. We sign ourselves from the wisdom. From the message of the gospel. Right? And we make the sign of the cross over our heads, over our mouth, over our hearts, right? That we may think according to the gospel, speak according to the gospel, and love according to the gospel, right? Word is proclaimed, and then the word, uh, what, is it, what does it say? The gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then you sit down. You sit down again to listen, right? To listen. It's a sacred, sacred speech so to speak, because it's within the context of the sacrament and therefore has to be proclaimed by the one who precedes the assembly. Okay? Not by anyone. And because in the tradition in the past, some of the priests or even bishops couldn't speak well, eventually the deacons were allowed also to give a homily. Okay? To give a homily. Normally it's about... The word of God has been proclaimed, but sometimes could be about the feast day, it could be about some other particular matter, important or according to the need of the people. Okay, but normally, normally, normally should be from the word of God without becoming exegesis, without becoming an academic show of talent. Right? Let me tell you what I know about sacred scripture, and here I go. Right? Meanwhile, everybody's falling asleep. Right? So it has to be short, sweet, to the point, right? Like your wonderful pastor does every single time he comes to the altar. Obviously, right? Okay, so we leave, we leave the evangelarium open. We have given the homily. We go back to the sedes, right? So we go this way, right? And we continue with the mass. We proclaim together the profession of faith. Obviously, when there is something important for us to do, we rise, we stand up, right? And we proclaim the faith through the creed, the Nicene-Constantinopolitan creed, right? 
Nicino Constantinopolitan. Why Nicino Constantinopolitan? Because it was made up from several several uh, councils. The Council of Nicaea, the divinity of Jesus Christ, and from the different councils of Constantinople, especially the first one, which he proclaimed the divinity of Jesus Christ and the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. Right? I believe in God the Father, I believe in God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then later on was added the church, right? With the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Okay? After that, the prayers of the faithful. Prayers of the faithful means that we pray for everybody, the whole world, both living and the dead, right? As you might probably uh, remember. Introduced by the priest, the beginning and concluding at the end by the priest. Because it's of the faithful, the deacon can, can say it, or also, because it's of the faithful, can be proclaimed by a lay person, okay? As we do during daily masses. And after that comes the second part of the mass, which is the liturgy of the Eucharist, right? The liturgy of the Eucharist, the heart of the mass, properly speaking. In the liturgy of the Eucharist, we have, first of all, the deacon, and in the absence of a deacon, the priest comes and prepares the altar, right? Only ordained ministers can access the altar at this moment, right? Because it's a circuit moment, right? They come, present the chalice, first and foremost, okay? The chalice, this is the chalice, okay? And then the chalice has one or several, these are corporals, corporal. Corporal is a piece of cloth folded in a particular way where the sacred vessels are going to be placed, right? We don't lift. We don't go like this and lift the corporal. Why? Because there are particles, sacred particles here. That's why we fold it like this, almost like, a, like if it were a pocket, right? And we, the priests, okay, made at this moment a decision to consecrate only what is on the corporal. That's why we put several of them. What is not on the corporal, even if it's on the altar, is not consecrated. Okay, that's why the deacon has to be on, on the ball, so that everything that needs to be consecrated goes to the altar on the corporal, right? So corporal, after the corporal comes the paul, P-A-L-L, not P-A-U-L, the paul. So it's like a little cover that, he, that is used to cover the chalice when mosquitoes are around. I promise you, that's what it is. Right? That's really, right? You don't want to have, you know, holy insects. Because if one of them lands, you know what you do? You don't stick your finger and say, oops, right? You drink it, right? Special proteins for the day, okay? Let me tell you. Sometimes those little, those little animals don't die as they land on the second wine. Okay? Nice experience, okay? So deacons, please make sure that, in, especially in springtime, you cover it with the paw. Not with the, not with the corporal, I mean with the purificator, with this other thing. This purificator is like a little handkerchief. We don't use this to blow our nose, okay? We use this to, you know, wipe our, our mouth, okay? Or purify the chalices or do ablutions. Actually, purify, no, it's not the right word. Do the ablutions on the sacred vessels. This is called paten, paten. This one is called ciborium, ciborium, all right? Ciborium means it's a place where you eat in Latin. Chibus means food, ciborium, that where you eat from, ciborium. The plural, not ciboriums, ciboria, ciboria, okay? We have many ciboria there. We use many. They're not bowls, not bowls, okay? I'm looking at your faces. <laughs> Extraordinary ministers, okay? Ciboria. You have... What is this called? It's not cup. Thank you. Chalice. Not cup. Okay? 
When I consecrate hosts, what do I call them? What is inside of this? Sacred species. Okay? Sacred species of bread. You can say that. Not host. You don't have host. You had the body of Christ. Okay? We had to say what it really means and what we really believe, not what you think it's easier to explain yourself to come across. Right? Even if it's more difficult. The sacred species of bread, the sacred species of wine, because they are consecrated. All right? You don't hold Jesus. I mean, you hold Jesus Christ, obviously, but you are going to do it through the sacred species. Okay? Chalice, Chalice, Patton, Tiborium, Purificator, Corporal, Paul. Okay? Last one. Well, second to the last. What is this called? Cruet. 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 Okay. The cruet for the wine. It's almost gone. It has a floaty there. Cruet for the, wa for the water. Okay. There are cruets. Okay. And then the last one. Let's just for practical purposes, let's just take this. This is called lavabo. Lavabo. Means in Latin means I will wash. Lavabo. Okay? I will wash. Lavabo. Together with the little pitcher, right? For the deacons, please pour water. Sometimes it's like drips. It's like what are there? Are the saws is getting on our case so, so that we don't use a lot of water when I cleanse my fingers? I had to use water to cleanse my fingers, right? Symbolic, but still. You know? There's a, an altar server who barely puts two drops. It's like, man, how stingy are you? <laughs> We're not charging you in the water. Don't think that your parents are going to, going to be, you know, tallied on how many drops of water you are going to put on my, my fingers. Okay? So you prepare the, uh, everything that is needed for at the offertory. And anything that is not consecrated has to be taken away. Right? So the cruets go away. And the lavabo, right? Once the deacon gets everything ready, then the priest more or less times himself and goes over to receive the offerings, right? The offerings from the community, right? So they process, right? They process to the altar. They bring the gifts. Normally, not normally. It has to be only the bread that is going to be consecrated and the wine with the water, right? The wine and the water. Why the wine and the water? Because also the water is going to be used for the consecration, right? One drop of water. Actually, you know that the proportion has to be at least five to one. Five of wine, one of water. If you use more, there is no, there is no consecration, okay? And if there's no consecration, if, we don't cons if I don't consecrate the wine, there is no mass, okay? One day, one deacon whose name I should not mention, right? Instead of giving me water for the ablutions, give me vinegar. So I, <laughs> it was very interesting, that experience. And many, many, many years back, instead of, you know, we, we're using right now uh, these candles, which are kind of fakey, instead of having, they're, they're not wax candles, they are oil candles. You pour oil, but the oil is, is uh, transparent. It's liquid. Right, so they would use watering containers to hold the oil, and they use those uh, the oil to fill in the cruets. So one day I, I had oil in my mouth. Anyway, many many years ago, not in this church, of course, not in this church. Okay, so once everything prepared, then comes invitation for, for people to participate. Pray, sisters, our brother, the sisters and, bro and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. When he, the priest says that, you stand, not afterwards, right? You stand, may the Lord accept the sacrifice for the play, praise and glory of his name, for the good and the good of all his church, right? Then the prayer of the gifts. 
Okay? Lord, we ask you to bless these gifts because through these gifts, right, we get closer to you or whatever, whatever the priest says. Pray a uh, prayer over the gifts. Then comes the beginning of the consecration, right? By the preface, the Lord be with you. All right? Again, the priest says, the Lord be with you. Now, how do you answer? And with your spirit? No, right? Then lift up your hearts. You know what I used to say? Lift up your hearts. Because nowadays the homily is lasted last 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the one who's more excited, right? In the past, homilies were an hour long, two hours long. So to say, lift up your hearts is like, all right, we made it until this moment, all right? Good for you, all right? Kudos because you got past the toughest moment of the Mass. Now comes the easy part, all right? And that's why you answer, we have them raised up to the Lord, right? Let us give thanks to the Lord our God because we're going to give thanks. And then the preface starts, right? It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, rightly so, to give you thanks, right? Because whatever we celebrate at that moment, right? And concludes with the holy, holy, holy. Why holy, holy, holy? Because it's a three, God is a three times holy. It's a, it's a Hebrew or Hebraic way to say God is most holy. They would use, since they don't have superlatives, Hebrew doesn't have superlatives, they would repeat three times, right? You, God, are holy, holy, holy. Or you are God, God, God. You are, you know, humble, 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 right? Or you are best, 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 right? Super good, super best, right? That's what they would say in Hebrew. And that's why we maintain that tradition. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, right? We conclude with uh, the holy, holy, holy. And we start the Eucharistic prayer, right? The most solemn, solemn moment of the Mass. And the most solemn moment of the Mass starts with the invocation of the Holy Spirit. You are holy indeed, God, blah, 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 blah. Make your spirit come down upon these gifts. Make your spirit come down. And we, the priests, put our hands over the gifts, right? Like this. Position the symbol, the typical symbol, the, the classic or the traditional symbol of the descent of the Holy Spirit. If it helps you remember what the angel said to Mary, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and he will overshadow you. Nice thing is that there is a light right here. And if you stand right next to me, you'll see that there is a shadow cast over the gifts, right? As if protecting them, as if the Holy Spirit coming upon them. That moment is the second most sacred time of the Mass. It's called epiklesis. Epiklesis means to call upon in Greek. Epi, upon, klesis means to call. Like ecclesia, church, right? Ecclesia means to call from, right? Epiklesis, the epiklesis, right? Send forth your spirit and it has a beautiful uh, expression in the second second Eucharistic prayer, like the dewfall. Have you seen the dewfall? How it grows, right? Almost spontaneously, right? Transform the gifts almost like a dewfall. This is really beautiful expression, right? So as you know, we have four Eucharistic prayers that are used in ordinary times. Ordinary means throughout the year, and there are other, I believe, six Eucharistic prayers that are extraordinary that we hardly ever use, right? That were added after the Second Vatican Council, around the Second Vatican Council, uh, as uh, from a petition of, I believe, the Swiss Conference, okay? Which the Pope, uh, back in those days, Pope, Pope Paul VI, deemed uh, that were worthy, but not to take place of the four ordinary Eucharistic prayers, right? Um, at that moment, we in America, we kneel down, after the holy, 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 at the beginning of the consecration, whereas the rest of the uh, Catholic Church kneels down when the priest uh, says the piclesis. Why is that? Because, again, during uh, the Second Vatican Council, a little bit afterwards, the American bishops asked the Pope if, if they could remain, if the assembly could remain kneeling down from the moment of the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer till the end, to the, uh, till the end of the Our Father. If you notice, if you go to Mass in Spanish and there are some visitors, sometimes they kneel down afterwards and they stand right away after the consecration because they don't know.
because in other countries, in absolutely, I would say every single other country, they kneel down at the epiclesis and stand up after the consecration, the mystery of faith, okay? So know that difference. And don't think, oh, these people don't know what they are doing. What is this, right? They kneel, stand up right away, okay? So after the epiclesis comes the memorial of the Last Supper, memorial, right? Bring into the present what was uh, what happened at Calvary. Not at the Last Supper. At Calvary, at the Last Supper, it called for the future, Calvary. And for us, we go back to the past, okay, at Calvary, remembering the words that Jesus Christ said at the moment of the Last Supper. Does that make sense? Right? So we said, we say this, what we celebrate in the sacrament of the Eucharist in Mass, in that unbloody manner, was brought about in a bloody manner on Calvary. Exactly the same thing. And that's why we say, or we commemorate, because we can't say the same words. We don't know exactly what the Lord said. By the way, the Lord didn't speak in Latin when he said the words of consecration. All right? The first language of the Mass was not Latin. Guess what language it was? Thank you. It was Greek. Okay? Greek, because what was the common language of the folk at that time, right? Could have been Greek, I mean, could have been Hebrew in some places, but mostly was Greek. The mass per se, all right? When it developed into the structure way that we have it, was Greek, okay? Greek was the language of God in the New Testament, all right? The Gospels, the New Testament, in Greek, the mass began in Greek and eventually turned into Latin, right? Eventually turned into Latin, okay? So when people say, oh, I love Latin because it's the original words. What original words? What are you talking about? The original words are Greek. Okay, anyway. Not to say that I love Latin. I love Latin personally, okay? But we had to be also historically, historically objective, okay? So the words of the consecration, the, the, sorry, the memorial, which is centered around the words of the consecration. And the most important part of the words of the consecration is, this is my body. If you notice, I kind of, you know, say a little bit louder than everything else and a little bit more slowly because this is my body and this is my blood. If the priest doesn't say that, there's no mass. Other than that, it's fine, all right? You could forget, somebody told me, you just, you forgot the other day, Lamb of God. Is that okay? It's okay. I forgot. Sorry. I'm, I'm a human being, right? I'm human, as some say, right? Sometimes I forget that I'm human, right? A little bit below than that, okay? So, obviously, the most important words, this is my body, this is my blood, right? I'm not going, I'm not going to go into the meditation of that. They are beautiful words, as you know. The body which is given to you, but not given as a, not so much as a sacrifice, which is implied, but more than anything, as something that is given given for you to take and you to become part of. Okay? That is the meaning of the sacrifice. Not of being killed. It's being offered, being given as a gift. As a gift. And because the Lord is given as a gift, we give thanks. Because it's a gift. Right? How do we know that it's a sacrifice? Because there is a symbolism. On one hand is the blood. On another hand is the flesh, right? The body. When the body and the blood are separated, it's sacrifice. When they're united towards the end, right? After the Our Father, the symbolism is of the resurrection, okay? Body, blood separated, sacrifice, body and blood united, life, resurrection, okay? Among other symbolism, there's another symbolism to that, Okay? Then, after the proclamation of the faith, this is, right, the sacrament of our faith, right? We say whatever we say, and then comes petitions, different petitions. We, we thank the Lord for having make us witnesses of, and participants of the sacrifice. We give Him thanks and worship, and then we start asking for the living and the dead, right? For the Pope, for the clergy, 
for all of us present, for all those who are absent, for the dead. And after the dead, through the intercession of the saints, especially Mary, St. Joseph, and everybody else in the cohort, and then to conclude all of this we say through Christ our Lord, and then comes the big amen. Just as we said, holy, 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 because this is a solemn amen, because you are saying everything that we heard, we agreed upon and we believe in it. And as we say, amen, 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 big amen, super amen, mega amen, right? Superlative amen, right? And that's why we, many times on Sunday, we sing it, amen, 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 right? We stand up, you wipe your knees of the dust, right? You shake up a little bit your knees so that you can stand up, right? And then we start with the Our Father, the beginning of the liturgy of communion, right? We say the Our Father, the priest extends his hands, and as you know, you don't necessarily have to extend your hands or hold hands to somebody else, right? The unity doesn't come from be all, be all of us united. The unity comes from here and goes there, right? It's not unity there, it's unity here, okay? It's right here. We're all united right here. That's the symbolism. That's why, we, that's why we start with our Father. Okay? The symbolism of the Our Father continues in a dialogue. Right? The priest mentioned something, you answered. He mentioned something again, you answered. It is the Our Father, but extended in a dialogical form. Okay? And after that, concludes with the sign of peace. We have been reconciled with God, and therefore we have peace. So we give peace. Actually, the peace should be like this. At the beginning it was like this, but then it became unpractical. I give peace to the deacons, and the big deacons would go out and start giving peace, and the peace would extend. But since that is very unpractical, especially when you have 900, 1,000 people, then we say, now let us give each other a sign of peace which means that it's not the moment in which you are going to ask forgiveness to your mother, your father, your wife, your husband, your siblings, right? And you're not going to go around the whole church, right? Peace to the whole mankind. No, I mean, very discreetly to one person on your left, person on your right, person in front of you, behind you. And that's it, okay? That's it. Because... Peace comes from the sacrifice, not from one another. Okay? That's why I say sacrifice, the word sacrifice is important more than celebration. You celebrate because of the sacrifice, not in spite of the sacrifice, as many people would try to imply. Oh, no, no, it's the celebratory part, the happy part, the praise and worship. No, it's the sacrifice. Okay? This is a very sacred moment, right? And after that, the priest splits again, or not again, splits the, uh, the host, right? Takes one piece of the host and puts it into the chalice, as I said, as a symbol of the resurrection, uniting the body and the blood. At the very, very, very beginning, a symbol of unity amongst different churches, it was the bishop who would get the host, his big host, and cut it in many different pieces. And throughout the whole city... There will be masses celebrated, okay? And the different de deacons would go and participate in all the other masses, bringing a piece of the host and pour it into the chalice of every single priest celebrating mass at the same time to symbolize the unity, right? Especially during the time of the Arians, right? It was a big division in, amongst the church, Right? In order to tell who was who, who was part of, of which group, of the orthodoxy or not, the bishop would hand a piece, a piece of the host, a consecrated uh, species of the host, and be given by the deacon, and the deacon will distribute it throughout all the masses. That's the original symbolism, okay? which has been lost because it's impractical to do that. Imagine... Archbishop brings 137 or 40, whatever many churches are. By the time he gets to Del Rio, the poor deacon, right? Not only the mass is over, but his, the priest will be already in his siesta, all right? So that's why we don't do it anymore, okay? And then the, the presentation of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, because we have been, right, 
um, forgiven, we have been redeemed, who takes away the sins of the world, right? All bunch of phrases from the, gas, from, from, the mass, from the gospel, I'm sorry. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Calls, not the gospel, the, uh, new, uh, the new Testament that calls from the book of Revelation, right? Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Calls for the revelation, right? We're united in a way, the beginning of the gospel, all the way to the end of the revelation. Okay, in one phrase. Isn't that amazing? Right? And then we answer with an act of faith taken from different characters of the, of the gospel. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter into my, into my heart under my roof, but only say one word. If I only touch the tassel, I shall be healed. Remember that? So the centurion and the woman with the flow of blood. Right? Two pagans. Right? Then the priest receives communion. He's the only one that communicates himself because he is acting in the person of Jesus Christ. Then he communicates to the deacons or the deacon, and then we give communion. You don't take communion. You don't grab it, right? Because you receive it as a gift, right? You receive it as a gift, okay? That's the symbolism of you know, when you receive communion in the hands, how do you do it? How do you do it? How on earth do you do it? It's very complicated. I explained to you. Left hand, not like this, not like this, all right? Not like this. Believe me, I've seen it, all right? I'm not kidding. Straight out, left hand, and then below your right hand, okay? So that the priest, the, the extraordinary minister, places the host flat on your hand, if you put it like this, it's very difficult and the host can fall, right? If it's like this, it would probably roll out, right? And not like this, because the priest, especially if he's shorty, won't be able to see where he's putting the host, all right? Common sense, right? But common sense is the least common of all the senses sometimes, I promise you, all right? And not like this, right? Don't stand five feet in front of the, the extraordinary minister, because it's very difficult to stretch out, right? Do it once, it's fine, right? Do it 500 times, right? It gets tiresome. It begins to hurt back here, the lower back, right? And that's why we priests don't last long in ministry, right? <laughs> Believe me, I've seen it, <laughs> okay? Then after communion, right, we do the ablutions. Somebody told me the purification, all right? Be purified the vessels. We don't purify vessels because they're purified. Even if they have stains, they have stains of what? Of the Lord. How can be stained by the Lord? Right? It can't be stained by the Lord. The Lord is pure. The purest of anything could be in this world. Right? So he can, it can be stained. Right? It has to be abluted. Okay? Abluted. Right? Pure, not purified. Abluted. Okay? Ablutions. That's what we call it. Right? We put water, all right? We pour water in the vessels and then we dry them and then we put everything away. Everything has to go away. Okay? And keep the altar nice and neat, all right? I don't know why, how we, this thing tends to move. I don't know, there's a, you know, Casper the ghost at night and comes and moves the altar cloth. I promise you, I don't know how that happens. You know, I'm OCD, right? You never notice I'm OCD? <laughs> you don't notice, right? So I always look at it, and the deacons always laugh at me. But here he goes. He has to put it really straight and a little neat, because otherwise he, he'll, his head starts blowing up. Okay? So we, we put away all the sacred vessels, and then we come and sit. We don't come and sit down just because we're tired. What do we do at this moment? We have a dialogue with Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And what sort of dialogue should you have? Think about it. You went through the Eucharist. We celebrated or we participated at the sacrifice. What do you think Jesus Christ is? I mean, if you figure, not, not in the present. We went to the past. Where is Jesus Christ? He's crucified, right? So speak to Jesus Christ crucified. What would you say to Jesus Christ crucified? Oh, my knees hurt so much. 
When is the music going to end for crying out loud? Is that what you would say? Right? Man, the priest is very hurried because, you know, there's, I have some brisket in the oven, right? I might burn it. What would you say? You know, and honestly, we don't take really, really much time. Use the phrases of the gospel, different characters, right? Lord, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Behold, I'm your son. Receive me, you know, as one of your unworthy children, unworthy servants, right? Increase my faith. All those many little phrases that you hear in the gospel. What do you think that the gospel writers wrote them for? For show, right? It was for us, at this, precisely at this moment, that bring out all the meaning, okay? And then comes the prayer after communion, which is always eschatological. Have you heard the word eschatological? Meaning looking towards heaven, right? All the prayers after communion are always eschatological. Towards him. Now that we have received the sacrament of, of your love, Lord, may we enjoy what we see now under the signs to receive fully under, uh, in, in reality, to Christ our Lord. Something like that, okay? And then comes the famous, famous announcements, right? You sit, the priest talks for a little bit. Now, there's a tradition. I don't know why, to be honest. I don't know why, but you take it personal. Uh, I had the experience of, of uh, witnessing something that it really struck me very hard. The clapping in the church, right? Right? Why clapping? Are we in a show? Are we in, a, in, a, in the theater, in the movies? No, we're in witnessing the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right? So imagine I was with a whole bunch of people in Italy, in Rome, in St. Peter's Basilica, the main celebrant was St. John Paul II, right? And we had a super wonderful music, a wonderful orchestra. And everybody spontaneously began to clap. The Pope, he ran to the microphone and he said, Since when do the slaves praise the other slaves in front of their Lord? And everybody stopped. Okay? Take it where he came from. This pretty two eyes, all right? So that, all right? So there you have it. Now, that everybody else does it, that's how it has just been a tradition to keep it and keep it and keep it. But that is part of it? No, it's not part of it, right? So let's see if you can help me to continue to grow in the reverence of what we do, right? Not to look stiff, you know, like be at the time, like, Right? Because that's not, that's not the way to go about it either. Right? Natural, but at the same time with reverence, with love. Right? Remember what the Sacred Heart of Jesus told St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, right? Behold the heart that has given so much love and instead he has received a lot of contempt. At least you love me. Right? Don't worry about what everybody else does. Right? It's not up to us. At least you love me. Right? At least you love me. At least you praise me as you should. And then, as we did at the beginning, we venerate the altar, we genuflect, and then we process out. And after we process, then, and after everybody sings, because everybody should sing, then you can process out, right? As we are remembering, reminding everybody that you process out precisely because you are taking part in the procession. Okay? in the form of the priest and uh, those who participate on the altar. Okay? Okay. So I was able to almost get it on time. I was 8 or 2. Two minutes late because I started two minutes late as well. Okay? So one hour. If anyone would like to leave, he's more than welcome to go. If anybody has questions, right, very quickly, I'll give three questions. Yes? I will bless you. That's for sure. Yes? No. You're not supposed to bow when the priest comes and goes. All right? Because it's not the priest. Right? It's not about the priest. It's about the center. It's right here.
Okay? We're moving towards the altar. Okay? Yes? Yes. Yes. How are we supposed to do it like this or like this? I can tell you what you should not do. And what you should not do is like this. Okay? Precisely because of the unity of the priesthood. We're united to the priesthood of Jesus Christ, represented in the ministry of the priest. That's why. Okay? The transubstantiation, you mean? The transubstantiation. Okay. So we have, there are two parts to everything that exists, right? What we call the species, those things that are sensitive, that are, can be accessed to by our, our senses. Color, right? Touch, right? Sound, right? Texture, uh, anything that relates to the touching, right? Touching, feeling, hearing, seeing, right? Uh, anything else? Huh? Smelling, all right? Those are properties of the things, but they're not the things, right? If I have a chicken and the chicken doesn't have smell, it's still a chicken, right? Still a chicken, right? If the chicken is green, is it a chicken, right? If a chicken doesn't walk, it's still a chicken, right? Those are properties, right? When we say about transubstantiation, is that properties remain, right? The smell, the touch, the seeing. But what changes is the essence. It's no longer, and I'm sorry for the comparison, it just came to me, I don't know why I'm thinking about food. Chicken is no longer there. Okay? Even if you can taste it, feel it, touch it. All right? And you, you can say, well, how do you know about that? It's kind of goofy. Well, there's Eucharistic miracles that prove otherwise. Okay? And spiritually, the Word of God, the Word of Jesus Christ, that said, do this in memory of me. Okay? So there is scientific proof and there is a spiritual proof. Right? And the fact that we all believe in that. Okay? In very simple words, okay? Transubstantiation. May the Lord, Lord forgive me for not being very, very uh, more in, uh, deep and maybe not uh, having such an imperfect comparison. Okay? Yes? Okay. Yes. Right. Right. Bow, bow before communion. What it says in the general introduction to Roman Missal says, make one act of faith before the Eucharist, which could be a genuflection, could be a bowing, could be putting your hands together. It says one, not five. Not genuflecting, bowing, putting your hands together and everything. All right? Just one act, simple act of faith. Right? It could be just an act of faith, all right? It doesn't specify more than that, okay? The last one. The last two, okay. Yes? That's a good question. It's also something that just came out. People begin to say, you know, Saint, I don't know, Saint, I don't know, Saint, I don't know, Saint, I don't know, and begin to... Right. People started with the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel. It's a devotion. It's not something that we, we are obliged to say or to do. Okay? When the Mass is ended, the Mass is ended. Right? But it's good, it's good. But it's a devotion. It's not part of the Mass. Okay? You should not. I mean, you should not in the sense that you're not obliged to. You're not obliged to do it. You could do it, but you're not obliged to do it. Okay? No, it is not a tradition in the sense that it was not established by officially. It's not that we're all obliged to do. No. No, it is not. Promise you. This priest right here, right? It's a devotion, all right? And so devotion is good, but not as something that we should do. No. Promise you. Look it up. I dare you. <laughs> Believe me, I know my stuff. I promise you, eh? Yes.
the significance of putting the leftover host Locking the tabernacle, well, it's just a means of security and uh, uh, at the same time a way to have access to devotion after the, the Mass is sent. Okay? Only the Latin Church has devotion to the Eucharist after Mass. No other, no other, I don't say denom no other Christian group has a devotion to the Eucharist as much as we do. Okay? The other ones, other ones have devotion to, the, to icons, right? Which is good and legitimate. You know, we develop more of the devotion to the Eucharist. Especially after the uh, the miracle in Bolsena in the 1200s, okay. I can say a lot more on that. You know, get me excited on those things. Ready to go because he's late, and and the gut is grumbling. All right. Well, thank you. I give you a little little blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Somebody back there acted as he was clapping. God bless you. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.